I thought maybe I would just take a moment to introduce Russell Kirk to those of you who are not familiar with him. Russell Kirk is probably the best known conservative intellectual of the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, indeed, he is the guy more than anyone else who brought the word conservative back into American political discourse. And in 1950, almost no American political thinker would have described himself as conservative. And Russell Kirk rescued that term, so to speak, with his book, The Conservative Mind, which was published in 1953. Uh, we're at an event sponsored by the Edmund Burke Foundation. Kirk is also the guy who brought Edmund Burke back into the political conversation and uh, told conservatives they needed to pay attention to Edmund Burke. So if you're not familiar with Russell Kirk, I encourage you to get familiar with him and to read some of his books like uh, Roots of American Order or um, what was recently republished as Russell Kirk's Concise Guide to Conservatism. They're, they're well worth your time. But in the 1950s and 1960s, Kirk and Frank Meyer had several exchanges, uh, both in the pages of National Review and in other publications as well. And uh, Paul Gottfried made brief reference uh, to the dispute between Kirk and Meyer, which I'll flesh out a little more here. Uh, Meyer criticized the conservative mind upon its publication uh, on two different occasions in the mid-50s. The second of those essays in which he critiqued the conservative mind, uh, that essay was titled, Collectivism Rebaptized. So it was a very aggressive title going after Kirk for um, allegedly betraying this individualist tradition that, uh, that Meyer saw himself as promoting. And when uh, William F. Buckley recruited Kirk to uh, write for National Review, Kirk agreed to write a regular column, but he didn't want to be on the masthead as an editor because uh, he knew that Meyer was on the masthead and didn't want to be too closely associated with the publication that had Meyer as an editor. Um, Jeffrey Hart, in his history of National Review, said that it was a, a minor tragedy that Kirk and Meyer never really saw eye to eye because, in his opinion, they were really a lot closer on many issues than uh, you would think from reading the invectives that they hurled at each other uh, periodically. Kirk wrote a, uh, an article for National Review in 1956 critiquing John Stuart Mill, which he expressed uh, and admitted in private correspondence that that was really to, to raise Meyer's hackles because he knew that Meyer liked Mill. And uh, Mill uh, Meyer took the bait. He responded uh, defending John Stuart Mill against Kirk. So they had this little feud going on. And then when Meyer published In Defense of Freedom in the early 60s, Kirk wrote what was probably the harshest review of any book that I've seen um, that, that he ever published. And he wrote hundreds, you know, thousands of reviews over the course of his career, but he labeled uh, Meyer an, an ideologue of liberty. And the review was only like a page and a half, and he just said, I really got tired of this after the first chapter, and I really couldn't finish it. It's, it's really awful, don't read it. And so there was a lot of, seemingly a lot of bad blood, but when Meyer put together the book What is Conservatism in 1964, he invited Kirk to contribute to that, Kirk did. So there, there was maybe a little bit of a thaw in later years, I'm happy to say. But I think it's important to understand Kirk's critique of Meyer and of libertarianism more generally because Kirk maintained this attitude towards libertarians throughout his career, even in the late 80s, he's still saying the same things about libertarians that he was saying in the 50s. And Kirk's critique of libertarianism is centered on the idea that uh, he thinks all libertarians are disciples of John Stuart Mill, the guy that he's already uh, mentioned, he critiqued already. And for Mill, according to Kirk, uh, Mill was an ideologue, he was a guy that thought uh, you could articulate a few abstract principles, or in Mill's case, maybe one abstract principle, the harm principle, and then use that as a guide to all politics, all public policy. Now, I should say that when Kirk uses the word ideology, he means something very specific by it. You hear that word thrown around in conversation today, and often people will just use it to mean any sort of set of ideas or any sort of set of principles, but for Kirk it meant something very specific. He was looking back to the way the word was used in the 19th century, and it was this idea that you could get a couple of first principles through speculative philosophy and then deduce from those first principles everything you need to know. So you're trying to fit the uh, square peg of your ideology into the round hole of reality, and he thinks that inevitably leads to disaster when you try to apply that consistently. So this is what he think, thinks Mill was doing with, particularly with his uh, book on liberty. 
He called ideology the negation of prudence and the foe of imagination. Prudence and imagination are both big deals for Kirk. He thought prudence was the uh, most important political virtue and that all good politics is inspired by the moral imagination. But ideologies, by contrast, and an ideologue is a monomaniac. He's just, we've got this one idea and we're just gonna ram that through all over the place. And in Mill's case, of course, the ideology is utilitarianism, which is the uh, framework that a lot of libertarians are using in the middle of the 20th century. So according to Kirk, utilitar uh, excuse me, utilitarianism claims to solve social problems, but it kind of rests on this unacknowledged foundation, in Mill's case, of a sort of polite bourgeois society shaped by Western Christian norms and these are foundations that had been severely eroded, in Kirk's view, by the mid-20th century, even more so in our day, of course. This was Kirk's critique of the great Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, who was an outspoken utilitarian. And in his personal life, Mises is this you know, dignified gentleman of old Vienna, but he sort of takes the values of Western civilization for granted. And Kirk says, no, you can't take it for granted, they're coming for those. And this is a bone of contention between Mises and even other libertarians in later years. So Kirk knows that Frank Meyer was a former communist. Uh, to his great credit, he turned away from that ideology. But Kirk said that even now that he's writing for National Review and is on the right, he says Meyer is still an ideologue. He rejected communism, but he still thinks in this ideological way. Uh, for one thing, he's a champion of John Stuart Mill. Kirk doesn't like that. And Kirk believed that this idea of fusionism was this sort of uh, abstract notion of the primacy of freedom as sort of the silver bullet for politics. And Kirk disagreed that freedom was the only thing you had to pursue when you're uh, engaged in a political program. And there were libertarians who agreed with this. The Murray Rothbard, who was known in his day as Mr. Libertarian, uh, looked at Frank Meyer's fusionism and said, oh yeah, this is just libertarianism because when you take the political uh, program of just you know, rolling back the state wherever you can, that's libertarianism, that's what they wanted to do. Now, Meyer made a big deal about this continuum of individualism on one hand and collectivism on the other, and said that you know, we, we're too far towards collectivism, we need to push towards individualism, and Kirk didn't like that framing of the issue. He says that's, that's not the only dimension that we're looking at, individualism versus collectivism. Kirk was fond of um, saying that good politics pursues three different things. It's not just freedom, but it's also order and justice. And in fact, of the three of those, he thought order was the most important. And if politics is only about advancing freedom, then the other two things are going to get shortchanged. Uh, likewise, the individual and the state are not the only two relevant categories in political discussion. Kirk was looking back to an older view of society in which uh, individual participation in corporate entities like households and neighborhoods and unions and churches and guilds and all these other associations are things that are recognized by the state, what Robert Nisbet would call mediating institutions, and that the state, in most cases, does not interact directly with the individual. The state has to go through those mediating institutions in order to get to the individual. And Kirk says one of the great tragedies of the 20th century, he's echoing Nisbet here in his great book, The Quest for Community, uh, another book you should read if you never have, is that um, the state has kind of crowded out these mediating institutions. This idea of order, as I said, is very important for Kirk. And for him, order begins in the soul. So you can't just talk about politics. Order in the soul has to come first and then out of that order in the soul, you get order in the commonwealth. And you can't just say we're gonna do freedom in, in politics and then expect that we're all gonna have virtue once we get political freedom. Kirk likes to say that politics is the preoccupation of the quarter educated. And he applied that uh, descriptor to Meyer, unfortunately. Um, but this is, you know, Kirk did not think of himself as primarily a political thinker. He, referred to himself as a man of letters. He wrote fiction, he was involved in all kinds of imaginative endeavors, and he thought that a healthy politics had to proceed from that prior orientation. So when he reads things like Mills on Liberty or 
uh, Meyer's proposal for fusionism, this idea of libertarian freedom, he thinks, is simply a way to empower people to walk away from their natural and healthy obligations to their families and their churches and communities. It's just, you know, let, let the individual will uh, run amok. And he says we've got to have this moral imagination in order to have a healthy political vision. So if you look at Kirk's book, the, A Program for Conservatives, which was published in 1954, it was later republished as Prospects for Conservatives. But he says we've got these ten problems that we need to look at. And you go down the list of the ten problems that conservatives need to address, and like four of them are political. So he says we've got the problem of the mind and the problem of the heart and the problem of social boredom and all these kinds of things. And this was sort of like a, a critique of the people who said, let's just figure out policy. Let's just talk about the politics. And Kirk says, no, you've got to have a more holistic vision than that. But when I titled this talk, uh, Russell Kirk versus Fusionism, a conflict in name only. I did put a question mark at the end. You couldn't tell when David read the title. So if you're not looking at a program, there is a question mark at, at the end. Obviously, Kirk is critiquing Meyer and fusionism. But as I said, there's a lot of overlap in what they want to accomplish when you get down to brass tacks. Kirk thought the state was way too big. He wanted to shrink it well beyond what uh, a lot of other conservatives thought was healthy. Kirk was uh, much more of a decentralist than many of the other conservatives of his own time. Uh, he was very uh, concerned about the languishing of civil society in his own day and wanted uh, to revitalize that. And he opposed the extension of the state into new areas of life as they would crowd out traditional modes of social organization. So these are things of which Kirk and the libertarians had a lot of overlap in their thinking. And as Kirk went on in his career, he became more and more favorably disposed towards the free market. For example, he wrote an economics textbook in the 1980s, and when the reviews of that book came out, some of the traditionalists were like, whoa, Kirk's getting way too free market here. We have to explain this away somehow. But, but Kirk ha actually you know, understood very well a lot of the insights of the classical economists on trade, and he said, you know, trade is good. Maybe there's some things we have to, to limit for national security or what have you. But uh, he is very much uh, moving in a free market direction later in his career. He even said nice things about Adam Smith, which you wouldn't have thought reading him in the 50s. But by the 1980s, he was saying that Adam Smith is one of the three great pillars of order that conservatives should celebrate alongside Edmund Burke and Samuel Johnson. Uh, he was very much influenced by the writings of the economist Julian Simon in the, in the 1980s and the ultimate resource. Some of you may be familiar with that book. So I think there are uh, a lot of ways in which uh, Kirk and the libertarians, even though he always denigrated them, they had a lot of common ground. And one way Kirk got around this seeming incongruity is that he would say, well, if, if you call yourself a libertarian, but you believe in God and you sort of like the Constitution, you're not really a libertarian. You're just a conservative and you don't understand political terminology correctly. So that was a nice sidestep, but I think there's still something, uh, th there's something there uh, to say that you know, maybe there's still fruitful conversation to be had with uh, traditional conservatives and those who might call themselves libertarians, whether national conservatives really think they are or not. Thank you.